Nigerians have constantly talked about how the current crop of leaders need to be faced out in order for a fresh set of young individuals to take over the affairs of the country. This birthday hashtag, not too young to run, trending on social media, with Nigerian youths across the country clamoring for a young president. From the names that emerged during the 2019 presidential elections, Omoyole Shore was one of the candidates who made a push to compete against the political heavyweights in Nigeria. As we head towards the election year, the human rights activist, activist just last month formally announced his intention to contest for the position of Nigeria's president in the 2023 general elections. Shore, while making his declaration, said that he will run a socialist government focusing on workers' welfare, free education, job creation, and pension reforms. Joining us now on this program, as we discuss his presidential bid and plans for the country, is Omoyele Shore. Welcome to the show, uh, Shore. Good to have you on the morning show. Thank you, good morning, and uh, thanks for bringing me on your show. Okay, first, uh, I guess it would be appropriate first to congratulate you on your victory in court uh, last week when the Court of Appeal uh, ruled uh, that uh, the restraining order, the bail conditions that uh, you, know, you were given in 2019, restricting your movement uh, to Abuja, the Federal Capital Territory, that those conditions were excessive. The Court of Appeal in its wisdom uh, has now lifted that. So how do you feel about that? And that ruling, does it extend to your associate, Olakunle uh, Bakari, uh, who was restricted to remain in Oshun State, specifically in Oshogu permanently, and you to remain in uh, Abuja permanently? How do you feel? And how has it been since uh, 2019? Let's start from there. Well, uh, you know, I've been saying it even before 2019 that uh, the system will come after me. And when they did, I was prepared for it. And it, the penalty imposed upon me was basically to obtain a conviction and some kind of uh, custodial detention wherever possible without actually obtaining a conviction from the court. And the same applied to the young guy who was brought into detention from Ocean State, who barely knew me before we met in uh, the DSS detention. He was also brought in, he was uh, restricted. We were both detained for almost five months, and then he was restricted to Ocean State. The circumstances are the same. There's no reason for us to split here about whether he benefits from mine or not. In the same case, the same circumstance, or the circumstances and the conditions are the same. So if mine is lifted, his is also automatically lifted. Uh, but, you know, I knew this would happen, and I made the best use of my time in Abuja. This is, as you know, I'll probably be the third person who's ever restricted to a city after Pai Modu before uh, independence, uh, who was restricted to Auchi, and Chief Obafemi Awolowo, 1963, who was uh, restricted to Lake area of Lagos. Uh, I share that honor with these two great men. So I've been restricted to Abuja for three years now, not allowed to even go to Nasarawa State, see my family, see my mom, or even attend the burial of my brother, who was uh, brutally murdered uh, during that uh, unjust incarceration. Wow. Really sobering indeed. Well, that leads me to my next question. I'm going to refer you to the cover of today's This Day newspaper. It's Igbo's turn to produce president in 2023. Efeni Ferry, MBF, Pandev insists. Declare Yoruba's presidential bid inelegant. Now, even apart from today's um, cover, it's impossible to have missed the zeitgeist of the recent past in Nigeria, where there's been a clamor for a Southeast president of Nigeria. You have always fought for fairness and justice and equity in this country. It begs the question, why then are you running? Would you say your aspiration as a Yoruba person is inelegant, as is described in today's newspaper? Well, you know, each time there's an election cycle, the political elites in Nigeria who make these decisions, which is undemocratic, we throw a bone at the Nigerian people, the political space, 
And their sing song this time around us is that uh, they want an Igbo to become a president. And uh, it is not a decision that was taken with the consent uh, and the affirmation of the Nigerian people. If you go to Igbo land today, or where we are now known as Biafra, they are not even interested in your elections. So who, how do you tell IPOP members that uh, it's their turn to become president when they are agitating for a referendum? They are agitating for self-determination. The Yoruba people you refer to, nobody went to Yoruba to so ask who, uh, what they want. Nobody went to Nigerians. And I do not describe myself in ethnic, uh, you know, under ethnic uh, banners. I do not accept and never allow myself to be boxed into a corner because when I'm fighting for justice, I'm fighting for everybody. I'm fighting for every human being. It's a, it's a, it's, 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 it's a fight for humanity. Is not a fight for some ethnic enclave. When Kanu, uh, Unamdi Kanu goes to court and I go to uh, Abuja High Court and I sometimes almost get stabbed or killed, I'm not asking about his ethnicity. I'm, I'm fighting for his rights. If Sunday Boho is attacked and the people are taken from his house, killed, including his cat, when I go to court to fight for him or you know, join others to you know, I ensure that they get justice. It's not because, uh, you know, I'm thinking of uh, it as a Yoruba man. When I fight for the Shiites who were massacred in Zaria, I'm not fighting for them because they are Hausas or Fulanis or Kanuris. I'm fighting for them because they are human beings. And all of these people, Nigerians, whether you have an ethnic nationality banner or nomenclature, are entitled to good governance. They're entitled to democracy. They're entitled to, to progress. So an Igbo man becoming president of Nigeria will not make a difference if he's not the right person to lead. Because we've done it before. We had a Yoruba man who was president of Nigeria. The Yoruba people did not even, did not even vote for him in 1999 because they knew he would not take them to the so-called promised land. And he disappointed. You had an Igbo man who was president uh, for several years uh, in Nigeria, you know, it did not make the Igbo nation a better nation. It did not stop pollution. It did not give them roads. It didn't give them electricity. So why are we now wasting our time having conversation about? We should zone the presidency to the geographical area or the intellectual area known as the competence and great character. OK. So in this debate, I'd like to ask you, uh, what makes a good president? Well, a good president is uh, a person with character, a person with competence, a person with exposure, a person who has a very solid understanding of how to govern, uh, bring people together. He's also the chief human resources officer of a country because the president of any nation, even if there are 200 people in that country, cannot do all the jobs. So he has to bring in all kinds of hands uh, to make it happen, uh, to make sure that the country is well governed. And we don't have a shortage of that in Nigeria. What we have a shortage of is the processes that produce the right people to govern the country. These processes, individuals, political parties, and machineries, and also machineries, have thwarted our ability to elect the most competent amongst us. That's why we get insulted that it's time to bring an Igbo president. It's a very divisive uh, strategy to make people believe that if you bring an Igbo president to Nigeria, suddenly Nigeria will become El Dorado. As if it is not an Igbo president, an Igbo governor, that has detained uh, you know, a, a pastor for, for months now. And some of them, uh, you know, were the ones who started the massacre of IPOP members when they were governors, uh, when one of them was the governor of uh, Anambra State, particularly Peter Obi. So we cannot just discountenance the importance of great leaders, uh, people who are competent. That's what this country needs. You know, if I could invent an app that can govern Nigeria very well and make you have roads, electricity, make you have all the great things of life, your schools uh, good for the children and make the country uh, safe and infrastructures uh, working, would you be asking whether that app is made by an Igbo man or a Yoruba man or made by an Ibibio or a TV? No. You just wake up and be happy. You know, I lived in a part of the U.S. where I didn't know the name of the mayor of uh, my town. Okay. Because things were working. I, I, you know, right. There are some places where you don't even know the governor of the state because it doesn't affect your uh, micro-stability as a human being. 
Well, sure. Let's stay on this a little bit. Yesterday, there was a Greater Nigeria yes. Conference in Abuja with the theme, Together We Can, led by Afeniferi, Afeniferi Renewal Group, uh, Middle Belt Forum, and, uh, you know, the uh, pan Niger Data Forum. And one of the uh, uh, resolutions is that, look, uh, people from the South-South or from the uh, Southwest should not show interest in the presidential race for 2023, because that will amount, as a power you are the put it, to align the North and its leaders to play the politics of divide and rule, and that there should be consensus on focusing on an able presidency. The emphasis was not on intimidating other people, but equity, fairness, and justice. But from what you are saying, it looks like you don't intend to step down. Uh, you don't think that that group is saying anything serious. That's one. But beyond that, can you take us through what your agenda is for Nigeria? Beyond saying revolution now, what do you want to do? Were you to be given the opportunity to lead Nigeria in specific terms, very specific terms? Well, the first question is about the group that I met yesterday. I met uh, with Pa Ayuade Banjo the night before, uh, somewhere here in Abuja, and I was meeting him for the first time. I have a lot of respect for uh, Pa Ayuade Banjo, but I disagree with him on the issue of them sitting down in a democratic meeting uh, and choosing for Nigerians who should be their next president based on the same problematic ethnic uh, uh, lens that with which Nigeria has been destroyed up to this point. Listen, there are generations of Nigerians and we differ on how these things are, uh, are going to be handled. And I will say to you that those of us who did not participate in the civil war we have a different level of thinking that is different from those who participated in it. And those who were born in uh, 1999, children of democracy, as we call them, who are now about 21 to 22 years old, they don't think like the old people. What we tell them, and I don't have any problem with old people, is that you know, those old ideas should, allow, should be allowed to rest. And they should not impose it or force it on several generations of Nigerians who want to think differently about how to move this country out of the doldrums. They have tried it before. They've tried all kinds of constitutions. They went to several uh, constituent assemblies, constitutional conferences, and all these things were based on ethnic considerations. And it did not work. I mean, why do we continue to toe the line that has never worked for Nigeria? If you ask an average Nigeria at the time they enjoyed this country, I, you know, Anytime. It would be probably when the country was doing well economically, not when it was governed by somebody from an ethnic group. And, you know, it's very difficult to say that there was a time that Nigeria was doing well economically. But I saw somewhere uh, that there was a time that uh, the dollar was uh, lower in terms of value than the Naira. You know, so 70 co 78 Cobo used to be one dollar. But now we are 600 uh, uh, Naira to a dollar. And we are still digging into the whole of ethnicity, uh, of nepotism, of uh, religiosity. So what if the Muslims turn up tomorrow and say they don't want uh, Christians, which some of them are already doing? How do you resolve that? You understand? The important thing is for young people and the old people to also respect the rights of young people who are 75% of the population of the country to decide for themselves how they want their future to be run. You know, all these old people who are naturally on the departure end of life, you know, uh, or launch of life, should just let us be, you know. They must admit that they haven't been able to solve any of the problems confronting Nigeria for 62 years. That's how we found ourselves where we are. If we now sacrifice that opportunity that we have to have some young, vibrant, intellectually sound young people to govern Nigeria, and you go and assign or allocate to Nigeria, another president who is probably an ex-convict simply because he's from the southeast. Where are we going to find ourselves? Nowhere. And nobody wants to continue from where we are now, which is nowhere, to another nowhere. So to now go to the specifics of how we intend to uh, solve Nigeria's problem, I am 
probably the only candidate that you can talk to today who can show you a website, and it's showore2023.org, where all these things have been lined up, how we intend to solve the problem of uh, security, uh, problem of power, I mean, energy crisis that is facing the country, infrastructure, how we intend to uh, sieve out our macroeconomic policy, you know, fiscal policy, monetary policy, and fix the problem of our criminal exchange uh, uh, rate system. Because you have the wrong people in some of these places who are manipulating the system in their own personal interest. We all know all these things. It is the reason why I would never subscribe to another ethnic uh, banger uh, they are throwing at uh, the Nigerian political space right now, is that we can handle all of this without the pain and sorrow that we are going through. And I know you come back to specifics, but I had a conversation with you on your radio show that I will not reveal my specific because there's still enough time. There's a lot of time to go so that your political friends will not steal my ideas and they convert it to their own. Right. I mean, we saw the success of APC as a coalition in ousting PDP in 2015, and I think you had a similar idea when you joined PACT, presidential aspirants coming together for the 2019 election. You pulled out, you had your reasons for doing so, but will you be leading your party, the um, African Action Congress, into another coalition, or will you be going it alone this time? Well, I want to correct the impression you created that uh, the APC uh, coalition was a success. If it succeeded, we wouldn't be where we are today. I said they were successful the in ousting the uh, PDP. Of... That's a statement of fact. I said they were successful okay. in ousting the yeah. PDP. All right. Yes. So that, that, that's, that's right. You know, uh, it was one criminal set of people ousting you know, another criminal set. That's what I will tell you. Uh, in terms of uh, our political party, we are willing to uh, join hands with Nigerians anywhere, whether they, they organize other political parties, movements or their individuals who are who want to come together we don't want to label its coalition because these things are very tenuous uh, sometimes it's also very deceitful that you say you are going into coalitions of parties that you yourselves uh, created one of the reasons why i pulled out of pact after the first meeting uh, by the way because a lot of people didn't know that i pulled out after the first meeting was we went into a meeting of a six, I mean, about 16 presidential aspirants. Never met a lot of them before. Turns out that most of them were from the same political party. And they were brought together to attend that meeting with the purpose of rigging the outcome of that, uh, uh, that process. And I pulled out after the first day because I was clairvoyant enough to see through uh, the fraud that they were, they were going to perpetrate. So I'm not going to any coalition with just any how party or any how persons just because I want to create an impression that we're a big uh, political uh, coalition. What we need this time around is a coalition of the oppressed. And for those who have been cheated in this country to come together under one banner and uh, just make sure that uh, we fix our country and we push out those who have put this country uh, in the terrible condition that it is today. And we know them. Uh, and because some of them would also throw uh, curveballs at you. They will try strategies to approach you and say, why don't you join us? When you join halfway, you discover that you have just entered into a, variable, a very terrible tunnel. And uh, the only light at the end of it is an oncoming train. We don't want to fall into that uh, trick. What would a Shawara do about Nigeria's mountain debt levels, which a lot of people say is astronomical? And what would you do about this cesspit of subsidy that keep taking everything of our resource away from us. You know, I, I will address the issue of uh, the, the debt uh, issue. I mentioned before, this is a function of macroeconomic policy. Uh, and the major three components is, of course, how you, con you know, how you design your macro, uh, sorry, your physical, po your fiscal policy. Fiscal policy in this sense is how, how we spend and what we borrow. And I will tell you that the government of Nigeria has borrowed, this current government, the Buhari regime has borrowed Nigeria back into the Stone Age, or Stone Ages, if you can call it that. And what we need to do is to have a commander in chief of the armed forces who is also uh, very economically sound. 
uh, who understand how the economy of the country should be run, how much we should borrow, because it's in essence of our debt to uh, GDP uh, ratio, I mean ratio. If you're spending half of, or more than half of your annual budget in servicing debt, you're gone. And so what I would do as president is to go to those who have been borrowing money to us and ask them, uh, how much are we really owing and what are the conditions and terms under which this, uh, uh, these transactions were carried out? Because I'm sure that this regime probably didn't look at the fine prints of those loans. So we need a moratorium for repayment immediately and investigate what we borrowed because it happened before that we're told that we owed a certain amount of money. Nobody could find out who we're owing. I was just, just made a rough calculation and we paid back money we didn't owe. At the end of the day, turns out that it was a scam. Uh, those who packaged that said we'll be getting a billion dollars back as, uh, uh, you know, as revenue for paying those loans, and it never happened. Uh, so that's, that moratorium is something that we pursue immediately and ensure that we just don't pay back loans. And where necessary, where necessary, with integrity, we can start uh, some legal default on some of the you know, criminal loans that uh, people uh, are taking right now. Uh, but I would also go to subsidy very quickly, because I know you don't have all the time in the world, and I don't, is that you are not subsidizing petroleum uh, resources for the Nigerian people. You are subsidizing the rich. We know what is happening in those areas. Under Good Luck Jonathan, in 2012, when we were fighting against subsidy, people were saying, no, we need it, we need it. When we did the struggle up to a point, we discovered it was the rich that was being subsidized because they were bringing in water, water into a papa port, Tinkan Island, uh, Atlas Cove, where they uh, discharge petroleum products. And they will just ride it back and get paid. Some of the cases are still in court today. We found that in a particular case, a vessel, a major vessel that had sunk 10 years before 2012 was bringing fuel to Nigeria. How is that possible? It's the same thing that's going on under this regime. Anytime you see them telling you they are allocating tr trillions to subsidy, just know that election is around the corner and they are looking for money at all costs to run for election. I'm sure that is what is happening again. But the other subsidy that is happening that you people are not even talking about is the criminal repairs that are going on at our refineries. And the refineries are not working, but we keep repairing refineries that are not working. And we shamelessly, shamelessly, will go and commission a refinery that was built for about 4.1 trillion naira, which is the same amount of money we are using for subsidies. Okay, sure. Who is owned by an individual. Sure. But we cannot build refineries in our country or fix four refineries that could have solved the subsidy problem. It's a shame. And that is why these leaders that you have in Nigeria uh, must not only be consigned to the dustbin of history, some of them need to go to the ICC to face uh, crimes against humanity. Okay, so we have just uh, about two, three minutes to go so quickly. Uh, you were saying one set of criminals replace another set of criminals, but we look at the field now. Is this same set of criminals who seem to be better prepared? You are running on the platform of African Action uh, Congress. Uh, but in PDP, people are paying 40 million to get presidential nomination form. In APC, they are paying 100 million. Uh, the, your platform, AAC, has no money. You yourself, you have not shown that you have uh, cash. Uh, you have launched a uh, political action uh, uh, committee on the internet. Committee? Uh, yes, yes, to raise uh, yes. money. Uh, since first week of April up to now, you've been able to raise only 852,000 Naira. Uh, not enough to even print uh, posters across the country. How do you intend to pursue this matter without money? Well, I want to correct the impression that I've only raised 850 something thousand. No, that's not correct. Uh, we raised more than that. And you know, on a monthly basis, we make uh, uh, those uh, outcomes uh, open to the public, I mean, the accounting. We've not raised you know, the kind of criminal money that is spent in these political parties. But the important thing is to understand that money is not only cash. You know, there is cash, there is kind. There's human sweat, you know, uh, there's citizen equity, as I like to call it. People who on their own, as we're speaking, are tweeting about what I'm saying, are talking to people based on my talking points. People who are saying, look, we cannot continue like this 
and they are investing their own time. There are people who are putting posters on their own. There are people who are putting contents out there on the internet. People who are paying for radio, paying for you know social media postings, you know, boosting some of the things I've said. That has made it possible for me to be way ahead of some of the people who are paying 100 million naira. Because Nigerian people understand that nobody amongst these guys will be willing to invest his own 100 million naira to take a form. When the salary of the president of Nigeria in four years is 56 uh, million naira, I think. So if you are not going there to steal, why would you buy the form uh, for 100 million naira when your salary is just half of that? It's obvious that anybody who has done that uh, should actually be facing trial uh, for money laundering and other you know, financial crimes that's associated with, uh, with how they got the money. And I'm sure it is the public till. They stole from the public and then reinvested in this, like uh, I think uh, President Obasanjo, former President Obasanjo once said, and I never decided, agree with that man, but on that one I agree with him, that anybody who told you that somebody bought him a form, Never vote for him because nobody will buy a Nigerian politician 100 million naira form or 40 million naira form to do anything. I told you in 2019, we raised less than 200 million naira. But our 200 million naira campaign shook this country till today to the point that those who spent billions uh, have not recovered from our participation in 2019. And by 2023, uh, it will be over for them. Money will be shamed. Cash will be consigned to dustbin because the cash they have have no value. Our ideas cost a lot more than all these forms and their investments, their crooked investments combined. Okay, thank you very much, Omoyele Shoura, for joining us on the morning show. We wish you well.